alive? Am I alive? I never know if I'm alive on this thing or not. I feel like I'm alive. There's lots of people typing things. So I figure I'm alive. At some point, somebody's going to go, you sound as good, and there is Dave Rush on the job. Hey, everybody, it's Mike Myers, and it's time once again for the Monday, Wednesday, 2 o'clock Central Daylight Time live stream of Ask Mike Anything. The goal of this live stream is to provide those of us who are isolated by the coronavirus an opportunity to continue our studies on CompTIA certifications, in particular IT Fundamentals. CompTIA A+, CompTIA Network+, CompTIA Security+, but well, we can certainly go beyond that as needed. Um, the function here is pretty simple. You ask me questions and I answer them. Now, for the most part, people like to just uh, throw questions in in the live chat. Do keep in mind that we get a lot of people gibbering away and I sometimes miss stuff. If that's the case, usually uh, Scott Jernigan, who's online, or Dave Rush will remind me. But if I miss a question, Type it again. It's not that big of a deal. So, uh, you know, that, that's basically how the game is played here. We're going to start right now and we're going to run until 4 o'clock Central Daylight Time or until the questions end. So, if it gets a little slow, then I'm out of here. So, uh, that's pretty much how the game works. Keep in mind that uh, some of you guys may have more complicated questions. And for those more complex questions, I want to let you guys know all you have to do is send me via my email address, a question that you think might not be appropriate to just try to throw out into a chat window. It happens all the time. It's not a problem. Just send it to michaelm at totalsem.com. Uh, also, if you're a gamer uh, on Steam, I'm Signor Pepe. And uh, when in doubt and you're trying to find me, just look up Desweds. You'll find me wherever that is. But the main way, if you want to send me uh, a question via email, michaelm at totalsem.com is the way to go. So, whoopsie. So we've got uh, a guest visitor today. Ooh, uh, come here, big dope. Ooh. So we got Jack is visiting today, and he's a big, he's a big lump. Say hi to anybody up there, Jack. Yeah. Jack is a pretty easygoing cat, to say the least. He just sits on the chair there and makes sure I'm doing everything right. And now he's leaving. Uh, yep. Yeah. The Astros are uh, getting closer and closer to the pennant. Pretty excited about that. Sports, absolutely the best. Um, yeah, I know you guys don't just, just don't start. Okay, the Astros are going all the way. Um, what else we got? Oh, also, just because you guys are kind enough just to show up, we have uh, Ask Mike anything special deals for this week is fifty percent off all of the A plus and Net plus total testers and the same deal as last week. The uh, password, though, is Columbus. So I guess it is Columbus Day. Are people taking the day off? What does that mean? Day off? <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, do keep in mind that I think that my practice questions and simulations are the absolute best in the industry. Uh, we're already cheaper than just about everybody else, and now we're selling them at 50% off. So these are ridiculous deals. If you need practice questions, and let me rephrase that, you need practice questions. This is an amazing deal. You just go to www.totalsem.com, pack in all that fat loot that you want, and when you go to checkout, just type in Columbus uh, for the coupon code and you get it all half off. How crazy is that? All right. Today is PowerShell, kids, but we're going to do a little more in PowerShell today. This is a continuation of uh, where we left off last Wednesday on PowerShell. But in order for me to find like really interesting things to do in PowerShell, number one, the scripts are a little complicated, which is no big deal. But secondly, you probably ought to consider having an Active Directory system set up. So that actually deals with another question we had last week, where I was asked to actually go through the steps of setting up an Active Directory system in VirtualBox. And so the PowerShell and setting up an Active Directory box were kind of going to go hand in hand, mainly because there's a lot of really fun stuff you can do within Active Directory in terms of queries uh, or either to the entire domain. But you really need a domain controller to do all that stuff. So we're going to do a little bit on 
PowerShell today. We're mainly going to be talking about the ISE, and we're going to uh, step our toes into variables for the first time, actually do some scripts. And, uh, but they're going to be pretty simple, uh, the classic hello world scripts. And uh, once we have that, and we've got that up and cooking, uh, I'm going to take a break because, again, people's brains bleed whenever I do PowerShell. Uh, but we're going to take a break, and then we're going to begin setting up Active Directory. So this is going to be kind of a two, two, two parts in one, and then later, not Wednesday, but next week, we'll probably tie all this together and do some really interesting stuff because we actually have a domain and we can query an Active Directory server and do cool stuff like that. All right, so anyway, for today, uh, I do hope that you have a uh, Windows system in front of you and that uh, you have uh, administrator privileges to that system, local administrator. And uh, with that, we can go ahead and do some fun PowerShell stuff. How's that sound? All right, what else we got cooking today? Oh, uh, bad news. It really died. I mean, it died bad. Watch this. Watch. Yeah. It's dead, Jim. So I tried to get her phone replaced today and yeah, front works fine. So I mean, I still have a fully functional phone, but the big cool main screen, it's supposed to flash. It was flashing on me before. Yeah. So I tried to take it into AT&T once to get repaired and then the usual BS stuff that these police will put in front of you to keep that from happening. So I don't know what I'm gonna do. Am I gonna fix this thing? Pixel 5's right around the corner, you know? Decisions, decisions. All right. All right, so we got all kinds of stuff, people. Yeah, Dr. Quinn, is it DNR? Probably. Of course, if it's dead, then it gives me an excuse to buy yet another expensive phone. Uh, all right, so I'm just reading questions. Let me see what we got coming in early. Got 30 minutes before we started. Nano Sun. Howdy, partner. Is Gilly's open yet? Gilly's burned down 30 years ago, dude. Is Fuqua Apartments still there? Fuqua is still there. Near the freeway, south of Plant, yeah. Nano Sun, I know exactly where uh, Fuqua Apartments are for no other reason than Total Seminars offices are actually on Fuqua. So, how about the Monterey House? Is still there? Don't know. Nano Sun, you even still on? Eric, uh, yeah, uh, is this a live chat for CompTA Plus? This is the live chat for Mike Myers, popular trainer of A-plus materials. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only person out there, but yes, Eric, you're in the right spot. Just reading. Got Jernigan on the job. Already answered the questions I just answered. Yeah, Nano Sun, there's still a Fuddruckers. Oh, you guys are all still talking. I'm going to get Patricia Grace is here. Yay. Eric Crenshaw is on, yay. American Music Awards, yay. No, American Medical Association, Eric, come on. Anti-Mushroom Association, I'm very pro-mushroom, thank you. Eric, you sound like my wife, haha. -ha. Alan Duggan's here. Connor Wellman, hello from Kentucky. I gotta tell you, Connor, I was in Kentucky two years ago. Remember when the uh, eclipse came through? Uh, so I had driven up to Missouri to see the eclipse, and it was cloudy, so we had to start hauling butt east to get out of the clouds. Hello, Jack. And uh, we ended up in western Kentucky and had a blast. Kentucky's like a really fun little state, man. We had a good time. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Eric Crenshaw, where is this mythical I am here? Web Dev Boot Camp's here. John is here, Dr. Quinn. G2CU, good to see you. I'm terrible at these things. Tomas, Brendan S. Yeah, Brendan S, we're gonna, uh, you were the guy who asked like, how do we set up a Windows server? So we're gonna do it today, brother. We gotta do some PowerShell first though. Joe Morgan passed? Really?
Wow. Well, salute, man. Good ball. Thank you, Joe Morgan. Uh, you will be missed. Sure. Okay. My phone is just constantly beeping now. I'm not coming. <laughs> Uh, Tomas Protovin, a legit question here. Uh, the A-plus total tester online, Core 1 and 2, does each have 200 practice questions? No, it's a lot more than that. A lot more. But how many you see at a time depends on how you set it up. You know, for some people, they may want to just practice on a by-chapter basis, so you're, gonna, you're not going to get 200 questions per chapter. Yipe. Um, but the, the, the test banks are bigger than that. Now, so you're not confusing the uh, Udemy. Now, Udemy has a different test bank. Now, we administer that yes test bank, and we put a lot of great questions in there, and there's probably overlap in questions, almost guaranteed. But the, the Udemy product has 200 questions. Our big total tester is over 1,000 questions. Scott, don't make me a liar, but there's a lot of questions in there. Uh, Tarun Chandra, Chadha, Chadha. Sorry, Tron. I'm sorry I'm messing your name up so bad. Yeah, Scott says there's over 1,200 questions. That sounds more right. Anyway, Tarun has a question. Hello, Mike. I'm going to install new RAM into my laptop. Good for you. I've, no, I've also ordered anti-static band. Always a good idea. Where to attach the other end? <coughs> that can be tricky on a laptop sometimes. Um, Usually what you're going to do with a laptop more often than not is uh, you can, uh, assuming you're not running power to it. Oh, actually, shoot, a really good, oh, that would be a lie. I was about to lie to you, Taran. I usually pull the bottom off anyway, even if I'm just popping RAM to find a good place to clip. Honestly, Taran, to be really honest with you, I don't use an anti-static wristband to just snap in RAM. I am just very, very careful. Uh, and I've had I've had good luck so far. Pete Rose died a while ago, man. Man, yeah, it's Columbus Day. Fourteen ninety-two. Eric Crenshaw is correct. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, I want my fold phone back. I, I'm, I think I'm going to fight for it. I, I'm, I'm into folding. Pixel 5, yeah. Got to tell you, Tulloit, Pixel 5's got, got an eye on one. I, I'm going to tell you, I'm getting really tired of Samsung. Uh, a friend of mine just put in a new Samsung TV, a nice one, 4K, blah, 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 120 hertz, QLED. And uh, it has ads, like an interface stuff. And I didn't quickly see a place to turn it off. I was like, I'm not buying a TV. It's bad enough I've got ads in, you know, Hulu or whatever. Now I'm having ads within the actual smart TV app of Samsung. No thanks. But Google's never going to make a foldable phone, so I don't know. We'll see. Elbow. Mike, do you think the fold phone is broken because the screen doesn't work or because the phone doesn't see that it's opening? Uh, it, it, know it's, it knows it's opening because I get this big yellow flash on half of it. I've just dropped it on its head one time too many. That's all, Elbow. Brendan S. Hey, Mike, I feel I'm weakest of general... I feel I'm weakest at general troubleshooting skills. We all are. Does that come with more experience? Yes. How do you exactly study troubleshooting skills? Well, I mean, CompTIA has their troubleshooting thing. Uh, oh, good Lord. I don't have it memorized off the top of my head. I used to. A-plus loves to ask about it, the seven troubleshooting steps. Uh, and there is some value to that. Generally, when I'm looking at something that's busted, 
my goal is to zero in on what's where the actual busted is. I mean, I can fix any computer by throwing it away and putting in a new computer, right? Uh, but but the uh, the goal is to be able to zero in on where the problem is. And a lot of that does come from experience. A lot of it comes from just Google searches. I mean, as long as I'm getting error codes, I'm happy. Error codes at least point me to problems. But there, there is no, yeah, I tried, God, like 20 years ago, I came up with this whole troubleshooting methodology based on noun verb. You know, the hard drive isn't spinning up, right? Uh, it, it didn't work. And uh, other people have tried different types of troubleshooting methodology, matrices or frameworks, they've all failed. I remember, God, in the early 90s, even IBM tried to create these huge thick books. It's like, if this is a problem, then flip to page 231, then flip, to, and it was a disaster, so. Yeah, experience, Brendan, that's really what it all boils down to, and common sense. And also the recognition People spend an inordinate amount of time trying to fix something when the answer is, is to replace something. So when I make a joke and I go that, you know, I can always just fix any computer by replacing it with another computer, that is a real thing. And I run into so many techs who just, out of pure academic fascination, want to fix something and fully fix whatever this something is, where the answer is often, you know, wipe the operating system is going to be faster than what you're trying to do. Or just put another power supply in because that's probably going to fix it. It may not be the thing. I have a rule that I call the 70-30 rule. So if I've got a 70% degree of confidence that what I'm doing is the right thing, I'm going to go for it. And yes, I have put power supplies into systems that didn't need it. Uh, that happens. I've replaced video cards that didn't need to be repeated. But more than 70% of the time, I'm right. And I've got it done. Whereas the other person who wants to go through, oh, I need all this testing software and big stacks of screwdrivers and all this stuff. And the, the most expensive part of any system repair is you. So if I can you know, get past that and have odds that I'm right, yeah, every now and then I screw up. But in general, I just go for it. Jean Doraval, hey Mike, how would you go about diagnosing a dead laptop? Well, it's dead. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, laptops are always a little bit tougher, uh, mainly because it's really hard to throw a postcard on them, or at least one that I would trust. Uh, the, uh, one of the biggest things that dies inside of a laptop is the, is the battery recharge circuitry. A lot of times when you're physically plugging in an AC adapter into a lot of laptops, that that recharge circuitry is right there at the end. And just because people plug it in, they can damage it a lot. So if it's dead, 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 like it's just really not booting up, uh, I can almost guarantee you that, well, that might be a lie. So I guess the big first question is, is, is it dead when you have it plugged in? That's the other thing that dies a lot on laptops that people don't notice is AC adapters. You know, the little thing you plug into the wall, that little box, those things smoke all the time. And uh, this is one of the reasons I'm a big fan of sticking to a particular brand name. Like at Total Seminars, we live on Dell. I like Dell. They may not be the hottest machines, but they're built like tanks. They have great warranties. And if I buy 20 of something, that means I've got extra batteries laying around. I've got extra power supplies laying around. I've got extra AC adapters laying around. And if something isn't, if, a, if I've got a dead laptop, you notice I'm really concentrating on power here because that's probably 90% of what the dead laptops are. Uh, if I can't get a, uh, the pre-charge circuit to work, I could grab a fresh battery from another system and get it to boot that way. Um, the other nice thing is that Dell does a pretty good job of doing support for you breaking a system open and uh, it's usually a pretty easy thing to look in on a system, look at the actual power outlet, and they, when they're busted, they're pretty obviously busted. They've got a wiggle to them. And uh, I mean, if you're comfortable with the soldering iron, you can probably resolder some of those circuits. I, I, I'm batting about 500 on that. 
But those would be the first things I would check because I'm absolutely convinced that it's uh, going to be a uh, power issue. Mark Wheeler, is there a cheaper way to get the CompTIA exam vouchers for people on low income? Uh, no, Mark, uh, there isn't. Um, like we sell discount vouchers here at Total Seminars. Uh, they're about 10% off, uh, but that's about the best deal you get. Uh, I am unaware of CompTIA providing any deals. Uh, well, there is a deal. Uh, it's really hard to get. You have to get it through a school. So if CompTIA has a education to CompTIA E2C, oh God, Scott Jernigan, don't let me lie here. Uh, E2C deals through schools where they get deeply discounted vouchers, but that's like high schools and stuff like that. So um, that's probably about the best route I could think of. Otherwise, no. Yeah, they got to make money. They're a nonprofit, but they got to make money. Don't ask me. Andre is on. Andre passed the A plus this morning. Hey, big round of applause to you, Andre. Well done, getting your A plus. Go get a job. Yeah, I'm going to be babysitting for Jack Jack now for a while. Laura Bryson. Hello, Laura. Ooh, lots of people talking. How are we doing on time? 2.22. Yeah, I've only got about 30 minutes of stuff on PowerShell today. Looking for questions. Kevin Lopez, whenever I plug in a micro SD or SSD drive that has an OS image, my laptop freaks out and won't let me view the contents of the drive. Whenever I plug in with an OS image. I'd love to see the error code you're getting, Kevin. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, you've probably got some weird anti-malware on there that's uh, causing an issue. Um, but there is nothing within the Windows OS inherently that would prevent you from reading a thumb drive or whenever I plug in a micro SD or SSD drive that has an OS image, my laptop freaks out. Yeah, Kevin, I'd have to, there'd be some anti-malware. Give me, give me a, uh, give me a model number on that thing and a couple of, and some information like that. So the other question I'd have there, Kevin, is why do you know it's freaking out? There's an error message or something popping up. You know, take a picture of that error message and, and email it to me here. Let me get that email back up. And we can take a look at that. I am unaware of anything in Windows itself that would cause that particular problem. And I'm assuming you're talking about a Windows system. Now, keep in mind, Brendan S., I know you're looking forward to working on Windows Server, but that's not what we're going to be doing today. Mainly what we're going to be doing today is making sure VirtualBox is set up right so it's easy to do. Okay, Tomas, so you're, you, you have the total sims. Yeah, we got gazillions of questions there. Marie S., I have a question about OSI. No worries. Sorry for ignorance, but why is data chopped twice at layer 3 fragmentation and layer 4 segmentation? Fascinating. Okay, uh, Marie, that's actually a good point you bring up. So layer four at the transport layer, that's the primary segmenter. Keep in mind that for the most part, you run in, the, the whole joy of Ethernet is that it carries 1,500 bytes per packet, okay? The problem we run into, and it's not really so much layer three, I guess, let's say layer three because I don't want to create a lot of complexity there, is that the old 1500 byte rule actually doesn't work for a lot of other technologies, in particular DSL, uh, which is still alive and well, man. Dave Rush still runs on DSL. But uh, DSL can often have uh, smaller frames that end up becoming fragmented, and it's up to layer three to put those back together in a way that TCP IP is happy, okay? Uh, 
The actual chop up that we're talking about at layer four is a different animal. In that case, it's not because there's some particular technology that can't handle a particular frame size. It's because once we establish 1500 byte frames, Word documents and YouTube videos and a lot of things are a lot bigger than that. And there has to be an assembly disassembly there. So yeah, that's actually an interesting point. I could develop that more. Uh, Marie, let me know if that was enough for you, but I can take it deeper. But these are two different kinds of frag, two different kinds of things that are going on. One is because of below layer three technologies, in particular DSL, and then uh, the other one just has to do with the applications themselves and how they handle, how does YouTube handle 1500 byte frames at a time. Nanosun, humid planet Houston, who needs a strap there? Andre took your daughter to shooting practice. Andre, you sure you live in Europe, man? You sure you don't live somewhere in uh, East Texas? NM, is this the episode we are doing Windows Server? NM, no. Well, the reason I want to bring in some virtualization today is simply because we're going to continue on PowerShell, okay? We got a good chunk of PowerShell to do today. But uh, if we have an established Active Directory in virtual machines, which, by the way, guys, can all be done for free, okay? None of this costs a penny. Uh, we can do some more interesting things with PowerShell in the next, in, in next week. So I'm thinking this is the way to go. Uh, Francisco Santos, what do I think of solid state hybrid drives? I didn't know such a thing existed. Scott Jernigan, solid state hybrids? I've certainly heard of HDD hybrids. What are we talking about here? There is such an animal. Oh. I don't like this term, SSHD. All right, it's just a rotational media drive that has a ton of caching memory in it. I'm sure, I'm not lying here. Yeah, it's just a cache. Okay, yes, I do know what this is. Uh, if you're going to be using uh, spinning rotation drives, HDDs, if you can get hybrid drives that have the big caches, they are very, very good about handling writes. W-R-I-T-E-S. Uh, they're never going to give you true SSD speeds, but they're cheap and they're not bad. I, I think they're fine. Use them a lot. Daniel Riggs, do I need the book to pass the CompTIA fundamentals? Yes. <laughs> Daniel, there are three things that everybody needs to be able to pass any certification. Number one is a video. Number two is practice questions. And number three is a book. If you can raise your right hand and say, Mike, I am not a good reader. Books do not help me and support me in my learning methodology, then fine. You can get away without a book. But you're going to lean heavily on practice questions and videos to learn what you need to learn. So I tell people they need all three. And I'm not trying to make money off you. Otherwise, I'd be selling you flashcards. Hmm. Tomas, I'm sorry, buddy, you did a follow-up. So my question is how to know how many are there. It's at 2.15. What time is it? God, how do I get so far behind? I don't know what that was put together, buddy. You're going to have to give me more. Sorry, Tomas, I forgot. Daniel Riggs, I'm new to this, but I bought your course for A+, and your book. Is that, I bought your course for the A+. Daniel, I sell lots of different courses, and bought the book. Daniel, video, practice questions, book. Those are the three things. Terrence Tech is in. You're trying to learn EdderCap, NM? Why are you trying to learn EdderCap? Oh, yes. 
that editor tab. Sorry, I forgot. All right, we're about to start PowerShell, guys. Whenever I approach troubleshooting, I start with hardware and move towards software. I don't know, why, why do that? Uh, I don't like to separate hardware and software conceptually in my brain. You know, uh, I mean, at the very least, in order for something to run, it's going to need electricity, it's going to need data connections. If it's hardware, it's going to need some kind of device driver, either provided by you, provided by the system, or provided by Windows. Uh, it's going to need a stable operating system. It's going to need proper graphics to allow GUIs to come upload. It's going to have to have the proper uh, auto starting functions within the operating system itself. And once you get to the applications, the applications are going to need a proper interface. They're going to need the network running. You know what I mean? So I guess at some point the hardware stops and the software starts, but I try to look at them as one thing. I am definitely big on the concept of bottom up versus top down. You know, if Word isn't working, then I'm going to start with Word and then work my way down. Uh, most of the time, if you have a hardware issue, it's going to affect everything, right? If your network card's down, nobody's getting on the network. If your drive is giving trouble, nobody's going to be able to save files properly, that kind of a thing. Uh, but uh, I usually start top down, and then if I get frustrated, I go bottom up. Okay, does this computer have power? <laughs> yeah, Brendan has come up with a good troubleshooting philosophy. I'll buy it. Never found one I liked. You guys are all deep in that freaking out thing. I'm going to let it keep going. NM, is he going through installation or should we get that ready prior? So today all I want to do is we're going to start with VirtualBox because it's a Type 2 hypervisor I know and love and talk about how do we configure and set up a small network uh, one of the machines will have Active Directory. It'll be running Windows Server probably 2019 because that's an easy one I can download from Microsoft. We'll get that established. We'll set up a fairly isolated network, throw a couple of Windows 10 clients in there. So we have like three computers that are in their own little private Active Directory network running behind a virtualized NATed router. And we're going to be doing that soon. But we're going to do PowerShell first this morning. And M, you keep it. Okay. All right, it's about 2.33. I'll tell you what, guys, let's go ahead and get started. Hi, Mike. How about making Marie S.'s question a subtopic? Yeah, I miss, we could do a big thing on. Uh... All right, Dr. Quinn, 2.29 p.m. Scott Jernigan, let's do a discussion of uh, Ethernet fragmentation. I don't have a pen. So we're going to talk about uh, fragmentation. I mean, it's really not much you have to deal with it anymore. You used to have to put some settings in your router every now and then back in the old days. Fragmentation and how that might be confused with layer four. I'll throw that in. Wouldn't hurt for me to have a couple of pretty pictures in front of me when I talk about it. <clears throat> All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, now, guys, I need to warn you. I, I've certainly practiced all of these commands, but I can't guarantee that we're not going to have a couple of pops or skips in the record as we go through this today. So let's go ahead and get started, and let's uh, have a continuation. I want to pick up where we left off on PowerPoint last Wednesday. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and start really, I want to talk about variables and uh, some logical operators today, because that's really, those are the questions, they're literally objectives on the A+, so we'll definitely cover those, but uh, let's go ahead and get started with that. So what I would ask you guys, if you have a Windows 10 system, could you go ahead and fire up PowerShell for me? Right click on the Windows button and go up to where it's, what does it say exactly? Oh, there's a lie here. Right click on your Windows Start button and then Windows PowerShell admin because I have no idea why anybody would want to run PowerShell in a non-administrative mode. 
let's go ahead and get that started up. All right. All right, so uh, let me get uh, oh, so many windows up today. All right. So do we have PowerShell up and cooking? Let's get that going. I'm the one who needs to get it going. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. All right, so hopefully you're seeing something like this, folks, okay? So this is the traditional PowerShell, and we were typing all kinds of fun commands in here earlier. Uh, for anybody who wants to play with a couple of easy commands, we can do something like, uh, here we go, let's just do one for starters. These are commandlets. Uh, we did all these uh, last week, but I just want to give you some examples. Like get a local user, all right? So get local user by itself. This is a commandlet that gives me information about local users. So typing it by itself just gives me some information about a list. So I'm going to type in get local user Mike, and there's some information about him. Or if I want to, I can use a pipe, and I can say I want to see everything there is select asterisk and I can get all kinds of information about that particular user. Now look, the last thing I want to do in this class is think that you guys can memorize four different PowerShell commands and you know everything there is about PowerShell. A lot of administrators are often querying about users and that's why I decided to bring this one up as one example, okay? Uh, for those of you who are watching, we did a lot of other stuff. Let me pull something else up. Let's try. Here's another little fun command. Let me clear the screen. Uh, but up, uh, how about get event log? So I have to give it the name of a log. I'm going to go with, uh, oh, I don't know, application. And that's going to go and go for a while because my event log is huge. Oh, of course, now it's stopped. Uh, but as you can see, just looking at that command let get event log by itself is kind of useless, right? I mean, we want to tune this thing up. So we're actually going to be using event log as a tool as we talk about our first scripts, okay? So now what I want you guys to do is go ahead and close your PowerShell up. And what I want you to do instead is I want you to look for something called the PowerShell ISE. So just click on your start button and type in P-O-W-E-R-S-H-E-L-L -L, and then you'll see Windows PowerShell ISE and go ahead and start that up. Mm -hmm. And hopefully if you start it up, you see something that looks a little bit like this. Look, PowerShell works great just at PowerShell, okay? But a lot of times you want to put commands together to do stuff. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of PowerShell commands and we're going to put them together and we're going to save it in a file, a text file. And then that text file is something we can run anytime we want. Now you don't have to do anything special to make a text file. So like for example, right here, uh, I don't have a window for you guys to see this. Okay, I'll just bring it up the old fashioned way. Here we go. So if you take a look here, all I've got is notepad, okay? And you can see I've put a bunch of commands in here. We're gonna be talking about all these commands here shortly, guys. And then what if I, if I want to, I can just do a file save I'll do a save as, and I don't want it to be a text document. I'm going to pick, uh, hang on, I want you guys to be able to see this. So just give it all files. I'm going to call it Timmy, and, uh, and I'm going to give it a special nomenclature.ps1. Do you see that? And I now have a file called Timmy on my desktop that I can run anytime I want. And what I've done is I've prepackaged a series of PowerShell commands into a little text file with the extension PS1 
and now it sits on my desktop and I can right click it and press run anytime I want. Why would somebody do that? Well, if you're an administrator, you have tons and tons of daily tasks, mundane gunk you got to go through every day. And to be able to quickly just whip up your own little script file where you can run it, like for example, when we were looking uh, at the event logs, there was just thousands of lines and we couldn't even read them all. So you can make a script that lets you look at event log just the way you want. And then, then it's always there for you. You might want to filter. I'm always want to watch. Is anybody trying to hit 192, 168, 1.1? Or I'm only looking for error messages. Uh, I only want to see error messages that happened while I was, since I looked at five o'clock yesterday. So all of these features are, PowerShell is wonderful at this kind of stuff. And uh, we're just going to give you a little bit of a taste today. And keep in mind that uh, CompTIA straight up asks questions about PowerShell, in particular on the A+, plus, the 1002 exam. Uh, haven't been hearing a lot of people complaining about PowerShell questions, but I still think it's good stuff to know. So we're going to go ahead and cover that. Now, even though we can write PowerShell scripts just by opening up a text editor and saving it as a .ps1 file. The ISE is the tool we turn to for writing scripts because it gives us a lot of features that we wouldn't normally have, all right? So first of all, down at the bottom here in the dark blue, that is just good old PowerShell right there. I can come in here and I can type commands in here and they run just fine. They, they might be scrolling a little bit, but I can run commands in here. There, I cleared the screen. Up above this is where we can actually build our scripts. Do you see that number one? I can type stuff in right there. And on the right-hand side is an exhaustive listing of all the PowerShell commands for this particular version of PowerShell. So you can type these in and it kind of helps you build commands uh, just by clicking on something and trying to figure out what, what switches does it need, what constraints does it need, that type of thing. The ISC is a very handy and powerful tool. Most people who write code do not write code in old school text editors. They use some kind of environment that helps them. Uh, the PowerShell ISC does a good job because like if you forget a parenthesis or something, it'll kind of give you, it'll change colors to kind of warn you that it's confused on stuff. You can step through your scripts one line at a time. That can be convenient. Um, the one thing PowerShell does not do well is that little help thing on the right. I got to tell you, I find it more confusing than helpful. So for me, if I'm trying to come up with a new PowerShell command that I've never heard of before, most of the time I'm just going to get on Google and says, you know, how do I capitalize a string value? And I just hit enter and I try to find stuff like that. That's normal. That's okay. Who was talking to me last week? It's like, how do you, how do you get a, a past the whole uh, imposter feeling? Like you shouldn't be here. You don't. I got to tell you, the first few times you write yourself some PowerShell scripts, you're going to be like, it can't be this hard. The answer is it isn't that hard. You're just trying to figure out how to debug and put them together. And you do, you feel like a total imposter. I do. So the other thing I want to keep in mind is that as I'm going to show you some of this stuff here in PowerShell, I'm not a PowerShell expert. I'm good enough to do the stuff that I need to get done as an administrator for a Windows network. And I'm comfortable with what I'm doing. Everything I'm showing you, I guarantee you, there's going to be a PowerShell expert who's like, oh, you can do it like this. Okay, buddy, you're not here, all right? I'm here, I know this stuff works, I'm gonna stick to it. All right, is that enough caveats? Let's get back to the ISE and have a little bit of fun. All right, so the first thing I wanna do, and I've got a little close up here, so if you wanna look closely at the stuff I'm typing in. So what I wanna start off with is, uh, let's, let's understand what a variable is. Uh, but now before we do that, let me zoom back out. So you need to type a little command in here. And everybody needs to type this command. You ready? It's called git execution policy. 
I should type it in the right spot, and then it would show up. So I've typed in get execution policy. And right now, mine says unrestricted. There you go. You guys see that right there? OK. PowerShell is really paranoid about giving people enough power to run anything they want. You can erase your registry with PowerShell. You can erase your Active Directory registry with PowerShell, assuming you have the right permissions. So PowerShell is a little bit paranoid about this stuff, and understandably so. So for example, uh, hold on a minute. Scott Jerning is giving me information. Control plus plus. OK. Yeah, I'm sorry, Scott. Uh, these nomenclatures you're showing me, Scott Jernigan's telling me my screen's too small. And unfortunately, I am unable to use the tool sets that he's trying to send me in the background. All right. So, well, let me check. Is this too small for you guys? I'm going to check what you guys are saying right now. I guess everybody's okay. Scott, I'm going to gamble everybody's okay. Let's get back to typing some stuff in. So what I want you guys to do, and everybody, you kind of got to do this, especially for what I'm showing you, is I'm set to unrestricted, but yours is going to be uh, probably says restricted. So what we're going to do is we're going to type in, I'm just going to hit the up arrow key, and I'm going to type in get execution policy, but this time I'm going to type something beneath that. You ready? So I'm going to type in, oopsie. So I'm going to type in set execute, whoops, there we go, set, sorry. We're going to set the execution policy and we're going to set it to unrestricted, un, R-E-S-T-R-I-C-T-E did, unrestricted. And I'm going to go ahead and say scope. Current user. So did you see how it's handing me? Does that actually show up? Yeah. It hands me extra little pieces of information, so it helps me type some of this stuff. What I'm doing is I am telling PowerShell that I can run anything I want, is basically what I'm saying. Uh, there are a number of different levels for this execution policy. For what we're doing right here, this is absolutely fine. Uh, also, keep in mind, if you're not running this from an admin, you're going to have some troubles. Okay? All right. All right, so here we go. So let's go ahead and run this guy. Now, the problem is, is I'm already running it that way, so it's like... Oh, or no, it isn't. Or maybe I just had a straight-up typo. <laughs> Good thing I'm cute. Why, yes, I've run all of these programs ahead of time and tested them before I put them in front of you guys. Uh, all right, so this is actually, this is, a, this is a good learning moment for me. So what's happening, it says to type, I'm looking for the problem. And basically what it's telling me is that I can't have anybody called. Oh shoot, I got another typo. <laughs> Let's try it again. How about that? And I get this nice little pop-up. I want you guys to see the pop-up that comes up. Bear with me just a second. So I get a little pop-up that looks like this, and that's good. So I'm just going to say yes. We'll come back to the PowerShell ISE. And this time it worked fine. By typing, by setting the uh, execution policy to unrestricted, and then by current user, I just put it in for me, don't put in typos, guys. The next 30 minutes, all I'm going to do is typos, so just bear with me. 
Uh, all I've done with this one statement is it pretty much lets me run any script I want. Uh. Okay, just making sure that uh, nobody's asking me questions or keeping me from, I think we're in good shape, okay. I'm going to actually turn off my phone now. Hopefully that will quiet it down a little bit. Okay, great. And Scott, I've got Teams right here, buddy. I can see everything you're typing to me. Okay, so what we've done now is we've got the ISC basically ready to go. So let's go ahead and dive into this ISC a little bit more. And what I want to talk about today is, uh, well, let's talk about how to use the ISC for starters. So I'm going to type in CLS and clear the screen. So. If I want to down at the bottom, I, I can type in any command I want, just like I'm at good old regular old uh, PowerShell. And I can uh, type in, well, what would be interesting from yesterday? There we go. Let's just do like, uh, I know it's kind of zoomed out for you guys, but it's okay. I'm just going to type in git event log. And I'm going to say, just give me a list of all the logs that are available. And even though it's probably too small for you guys to read, what it's showing me is all the different event log logs that are there. The bottom part of the ISE is just good old PowerShell, OK? So anytime we want, we can go down there, type in commands, just like we're at a full-blown PowerShell. No problem whatsoever. All right. So this time we're going to be, we'll close this up. Let me clear the screen one more time. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. And uh, what I want to do now is let's go ahead and do our first variable. You guys ready? Variables make our lives good. So to do a variable, all I need to do is do a number sign and then give the variable a name. That is now a variable. And if I want to, I can give it an initial value. And in this case, I'm going to give it the value of one. So I now have a variable in PowerShell called number, and its value is 1. If you want to see it, just type in the name of the variable. So I just type in the variable, and it outputs. Hang on, let me scroll so you guys can see it. Look, see it made a nice little number 1? Yay! <clears throat> Variables are an absolutely critical part of understanding how PowerShell works. It's, it's tempting to think, you know, it's like, oh, well, I could just query my event logs or my usernames and stuff like that. But there's a lot of times where it's like, you know, I need to find everybody whose first name starts with the capital letter M and things like that. And that's where these variables are really, really come into play. And we're going to use them like crazy. Any script is full of variables. Let's keep going. So what I want to do this time is I'm going to make another variable. This time I'm going to call it Mike. I want to call it Mike. Let's call it name. And this time the name is going to equal Mike. Now I want you to watch an error is going to take place. Boom. So we've got an error here. And I, well, let me show you how to fix the error real quick. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put single quotation marks around it. And now Now it works. What the heck just happened? Well, my friends, there are variables and then there are variables. Uh, any programmer will tell you that when you're working with variables in any type of programmatic setting, you usually have to define what kind of variable it is. So within the PowerShell world, like anybody else, you can define the type of variables you want. Like for example, that number is just going to be, a, say, a number between 1 and 1,500. So what we will want to do is we're going to declare what kind of variable it is. We're going to call it an integer variable. Integer variables take up a lot less memory than other types of variables do. Also, because they're integers, if you do math to them, everything's cool. If you add up two integer variables together, you'll get another integer, right? What's well, 1 plus 1 equals 2. Get the idea? But there's a lot of other types of uh, uh, variables out there. You can have a variable called Boolean. 
And the answer is either yes or no, true or false, one or zero. And if you have those types of, of data where you need to study, store a Boolean value, those will be handy. Uh, the, probably the more common type of variable that we hear of more often than not is called a string variable. And string variables are alphanumerics, people's names, or whatever it might be. And when I declared name and put it in those single quotation marks, whew, sorry guys. You know, I don't walk around yawning at home. If for some reason I get on, on the camera, I yawn like crazy. I don't know why that is. Bad camera presence. So I get for doing it live. But a, a string variable stores just about anything you want. The problem is, if you take two string values and try to add them together, eh, strange things might happen, okay? So let's go ahead and play with this a little bit more, except this time what we're gonna do is we're going to declare these. So this time I'm gonna make a variable. And I'm gonna call this variable number, but this time I'm gonna force it as an integer. So I'm gonna do this int, do you see that in the brackets like that? Do you also notice how the tool is showing me that I've got a beginning and a, and a ending bracket? Do you see right now uh, at the T there's a little underline under it? That's because the ISE is going, I'm expecting a bracket. Oh, now I'm happy. And I'm going to say this equals one. So life's happy. But watch what happens if I try to do something like this. He doesn't like that. You just declared an integer value and you're trying to put a string data in there. All right. People often ask me, they go, Mike, why do we have all these different variable types? Okay, maybe the addition thing. I could see that. But can't we make interpreters that are smart enough to handle that? We are. And you'd be surprised how much you can get away with in PowerShell in terms of not declaring your variables properly and getting away with it. But uh, it is for good memory management. Uh, it's for good logic control in your own brain while you're trying to set something up. You're like, look, I've got 1,500 event logs I need to go through, you know, and I want to make sure that nobody, you know, from the accounting department, I don't want to look at there. So, you know, while systems not equal to accounting, do something. See where I'm coming from? So you, you can have a lot of power with the different types of variables that you use. In general, if you're going to make something a pure number, it's going to be turned into an integer almost automatically. And uh, equally, if you put something in single quotation marks, it's going to go to a string. Okay. These things are going to be real important, kids. If you're getting bored right now, you're about to get unbored really quick. All right, let's have a little bit more fun here. All right. So what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to declare an integer. And this is going to be integer number, and I'm, he's going to be number one. Okay? And then I'm going to do a string. And this string is going to be number two. So I've declared two different variables so far. And this number two is going to be called Timmy. All right, he bought that. I know it worked, guys, because I'm not getting any errors. So watch this. Now I'm going to declare an integer, and I'm going to call it number three. And I'm going to say it equals number plus number two. What do you think is about to happen here? We've declared one variable as an integer, and we've declared another one as a string, and now we're going to try to add them. Let's see what happens. All the red might be a clue right there. Boom, it didn't like it. And it shouldn't like it because we're trying to add a string to an integer 
and it's going to have a problem with that. Declaring variables as integer or Boolean or string, and there's a whole bunch of other values as well, is certainly not unique to PowerShell, folks. Pretty much all script, in all compiled languages, you're writing C sharp, you're going to declare variables like this. So uh, make sure you understand uh, how to declare a variable in PowerShell, okay? It's important. It's on the A, plus, straight up on the A. All right, so that was fun. But all we're doing at this point is we're using the bottom part of the ISE. Let's go ahead and make our first honest to Pete script. Oh, God, why am I so yawning? It's so embarrassing. I'm sorry, guys. Okay. Let's go ahead and write our first script. You guys ready? Here we go. So what we're going to do first is we're going to get the declare a variable. This time we're going to call it name. Okay. And we're going to show you a very, very important commandlet called read host. Anytime you're trying to get information from people, you're going to use read host like all the time. Very, very popular. And then what do we want this read host to say to the world? We're going to make it say, what is your name? Now notice that, uh, whoops, let me do this right. I am so much into quotation marks and I should be using single quotation marks. So if you take a close look at this, what I've said is we're going to create a new variable called name. And to get this variable, we're going to put a prompt on the screen and say, what is your name, right? And then the corollary to read host is good old write host. And that puts stuff up on the screen. And we're going to make it say, Hello, so you have to put all this stuff in little single quotation marks. But then what we're going to do is say dollar sign name. Look how he's trying to be helpful there. That is so funny. That doesn't show up. Here, let me put this on the left monitor so you guys can see this. Now watch this time. Ah, doesn't show up there either. I'm going to try this again. There it goes. So now you can actually see this. For some reason, it doesn't show up on my close-up. So I can actually just select that, and I can get commands. To me, this is where the ISE pays itself, because I certainly don't have these thousands of different commandlets memorized. I don't. But with the ISE, I can start typing stuff in, and it's going to put that little prompt up going, is that what you meant? And it, it's extremely convenient, because at least I know I'm typing in a legit commandlet, not type, putting in a typo or something like that. Okay, so we're going to do write host. And now this time, what I want to do is we're going to say, hello. And then I'm going to just put dollar sign name. And then uh, after name, I'm going to put in a uh, quotation, a uh, little digit. And I just want some text after it. Uh, make it pretty comma. How are you? All right, so let's take a nice look at that. So it says right host. Hello. Uh, we're going to get in trouble here. Me and those double quotation marks, guys. Double quotation marks may or may not work. I don't want to find out the hard way. So right host, a little bit of text, then a variable, and then some text that's comma, how are you? So hopefully we've done this right. So what I want to do is zoom out for a minute. And we want to run this command. So first, let me, let me clear the screen at the bottom. Now, what I want to do here that uh, is, is handy is we're just going to press the F5 key, which will run whatever's up here and make it appear down here. You guys ready? So let's hit F5. Once again, a window that you don't see. I'm going to bring it over here so you guys can see it. And it's just giving me a quick warning, saying the script you are about to run will be saved. I'm going to go ahead and turn this off for now because I don't want to see it anymore. So let me go back to the IOC so you guys can see this, even though you won't see that screen. It is there. I'm going to hit OK. All right, now we can zoom back in. 
And you can see it's prompting. What is your name? Type in a string. Hello, Mike. How are you? You, friends, have just written your first PowerShell script. The classic hello world, as we say. Let's go ahead and save that. So you save a PowerShell script just like you save anything else. So, whoopsie. Oh, man, me. I'm going to click on the wrong screen. I'm going to click on File. I'm going to hit Save As just because I like doing that. You can see I've saved. That is crazy. It's not showing you the same thing I see. Yeah, I'm going to try it again. So I'm going to hit File, Save, Save As. And this little pop thing pops up, and I can give it whatever name I want to give it. So I'm going to call it Jack Jack. I've now saved this. Now, if you guys wanted to scroll around on my desktop, you'd see that there is a PS1 file with the name of Jack Jack. And that from now on, I can run it anytime I want. Anytime you meet an administrator of a Windows network, they're going to have a folder that's usually chock full of PowerShell scripts that they use all the time because they've taken a lot of pain and suffering to find other people's PowerShell scripts, which they then have to tweak to work for their network. And they tend to like to keep them. And they tend to sit on their desktop. Because it's kind of thing, well, at 9 a.m. I run these three scripts, you know, clear out log files, or you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, so, and we've just saved our first one. And it's called jackjack.ps1. Anytime I want to run it from now on, just right click on it and select run. Uh, people are like, why do you have to right click on it and select run? Because in the registry, PS1 files, by default, if you double click on them, they just open up in a text editor. That is easily changed if that's something you want to change. It's a registry setting to do that, but it works. All right, so we have now saved one. Let's get back into our ISE. We ran, and we can run that, and uh, it'll pop up just fine. Mm -hmm. So just so you guys can see what actually happens when you when I run it. So all I did was uh, I right clicked on uh, Jack Jack and said run. So this is uh, for a type of I'm running the wrong file. Oops. Let's run the right file and try that again, shall we? <laughs> okay, run with PowerShell. Here we go. There we go. Sorry about that, kids. Mm -mm -mm. There we go. Does that look a little bit better? And we type in Dimmy. And it closes up. Because that's exactly what we told it to do. Why don't we go ahead and fix that real quick? So what I'm going to do this time, I'm just going to put a little command called pause. Pause predates PowerShell. It's an old uh, DOS batch file command, but it works just great. Let's watch it. So run this. Da, 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 here we go. Press F5. What is your name? Sandy. Hello, Sandy. How are you? And now I got to press Enter to continue. Ta da! And it works. This is the big thing you're going to run into with programming more than anything else: is dealing with the logic and features to make the interface and the function work the way you want. And a lot of times it's not that hard to find a script that will query the right event log or the registry setting or whatever it is. Usually the problem is, is how do I make sure I bring that in and it interfaces in a way that I want it to. So little commands like pause can be very, very handy. All right. Let's do it again. That was fun. All right. So what I want to do this time 
is uh, I want, I'm going to just cheat. I've got this pre-written, so I'm just going to punch it all in in one shot. I'm cutting and pasting, guys. And let me get this in close so you can see it. All right. So it says, I'm going to declare a variable called name. It's going to read from the host with the prompt, what is your name? And then it's going to write it out. And what it's going to do is we've added a feature to this. It's going to go ahead and send the name out. But remember, these are all object-oriented uh, things. So what we're going to do is we're going to take name, but we're going to put it to uppercase. All right? Just because I like uppercase. So let's run this guy. So all I'm going to have to do, let me down here so you can see it. I'm going to press F5. What is your name? Mike lowercase. Hello, Mike, how are you? Now you can see it's all uppercase. This can be pretty handy, but the problem is I don't necessarily want an uppercase. I just want it capitalized. So you can see in this particular case, we could add a feature to a string variable called to upper by default. So you can do a lot of interesting stuff with strings. Guys, I'm telling you right now, if you're going to be a coder, if you're going to be messing with script files, and I'm not just talking PowerShell, I'm just I'm talking about Python or anything else, you're going to spend a lot of time manipulating strings of text. A lot. Uh, somewhere in here is a date. Find something that looks like a date. Pull the date out. Convert the date string into a date uh, variable. Use some kind of math to find everything from December of 2004 to January of 2012 and then bring all these all in. I mean, these are the kind of things we do. Folks, that's welcome to administering Windows networks more than anything else. So what I want to do here is I just want it to be a title case, right? I want the M to be capitalized. And in that case, I have to dig deeper and get a completely different commandlet. Why, yes, I will show you. So what I'm going to do this time, now watch close, guys. So let me paste in this new one. Now I want you to look really close. So it, it looks pretty similar to what we just had, right host to low. But look here, we've had to pull up a completely different commandlet called git culture. I don't know why it's called Git Culture. I went through Google and did some searching and found it, and this is the way to do it. So Git Culture, uh, text info of two title case. You see all this? This is just, and then you put in the variable, and then how are you? Sometimes you just kind of got a monkey see, monkey do when it comes to code things to get them in there to get them to work. And uh, the other thing I'm going to warn you right now is that I hope you start playing with this on your own, but the one thing you're going to run into time and time again is typos. Oh my gosh. You're going to forget to put a, open, a closed parenthesis when you put an open. You're not going to put a comma in the right place. You're going to forget to put your little single quotation marks around strings. That is normal and it is good and it's okay. Just get used to it. It's a big part of the job. Let's run this one. All right, so everything I think looks good. Let me scroll up so we can see here. Let me clear all this goo out. And let me hit F5. Okay, what is your name? Timmy. Now, hopefully, you'll see that's lowercase, right? Oh, I've got an error. What did I do wrong? I'm double checking my text. I, I swear to God, guys, I tested all these before I uh, threw them out to you. I'm not even going to bother looking in the chat screen right now because one of you smart Alex is going to be like, ah, oh, Mike, you put something in wrong there. Yeah, I know, I know. Oh, I think I see it. It's subtle. This is actually a great example of what I was just talking about. Let's take a look at it again. Uh, uh, 
I forgot to put a dot right there, guys. That was my total error. I was supposed to put a dot right there. Let's run it again, see if it works this time. You guys ready? Here we go. F5. F5. There we go. All right, so now we've got an uppercase Timmy. I swear to God, I did not mean to make that mistake on purpose, but what a great demonstrator of getting the, the just one little period had, had that all messed up. Now, I could take some time and look through the error. All that, when the big ugly error comes up, it tells you where the problem is. I think Microsoft could have done a better job of making it where the problem is, but they do tell you, and it speeds, it, it, that's part of the beauty of the ISE. Also, if I had been looking at the ISE a little bit closer, I probably would have seen that there were some weird color combinations, and that's where the problem was. Okay, so what we've been doing now, folks, is we have declared variables. We've declared two different variable types. We have integers, and then we have string, okay? We see that there's benefits to having different types of variable types. And now we're bringing the variable in and starting to do some very, very simple scripts. We've also saved a script, and uh, make sure you remember what the extension is for PowerShell scripts, okay? All right, so the last thing I wanna do with variables today is I wanna bring this in one more time, except this time what we're gonna do is we're gonna be reading event logs, except we're gonna be using variables to help filter out what we wanna see. Now we did event log on Wednesday, and we redid it here a little bit today, but I'm just gonna assume that you can review the event log uh, commandlets and make sure you understand how they work. So uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and bring it in one more time. And I'm just gonna cut and paste this one more time. And what we're gonna be doing is reading a log file. So let me just paste out this old stuff. All right, so let's read what I've typed in here, okay? So we're declaring a variable called Fred, read host, da -da -da, enter the type of log entry, and then it's gonna get event log, and it's gonna come from our system, and then we're gonna say what kind of enter we want. So what I'm just talking here in this particular case is I'm gonna separate uh, errors from warnings. Anybody who's read event log, you know, a lot of them come off as errors. So they come off as information, they come off as warning. In this case, I want to just look at warnings, or I just want to look at errors, okay? Let's dive back in. So, let's go ahead and run this just as it is. All right, I'm gonna hit F5. <clears throat> So input the type of log entry, and uh, this time I want to look at error logs. So I type an error, and I get to see all the error logs, and there's my pause command. Now if I wanted to, I can filter out stuff. Uh, you can review what we did on Wednesday to see how we can limit maybe to just first 10 errors or whatever you might want to do at this point. I don't care about the raw data coming into it. I just want to uh, filter out stuff I don't want to look at. So there are some problems with this code. Like for example, no. so if I hit F5 again, and it says enter the type of log entry, let's, let, what if I do an error? What if I, what if I type in E-E-R-O-T? That's not one. Boom, I get an error. Well, I should get an error, folks, because there are no event log types called, what did I type in there? Errot doesn't exist. So what I want to do here is I want to tighten this up a little bit and let's see if we can throw in some error handling. Now to do that, what I want to do is we're going to use an if statement, okay? So let's watch an if statement in action. Uh, delete this out, paste in my other handy dandy code. All right, so let's take a look what I got this time. There's our declaring Fred again. Now look what I got here. See where it says if, 
and then I give it some uh, Boolean thing that can declare true or false. And now what I've said here, if Fred, do you see the minus sign? That means not equal to error. I'm sorry, if Fred is equal to error, dash e EQ, we'll see not equal in just a second. Then go ahead and get the event log and then pause. Otherwise, it's just going to do nothing. So let's give that a whirl. I'm going to hit F5. Enter the type of logged entry. I'm going to type in error. I see the errors. So let me hit F5 again. Now I'm going to type in Timmy. And you'll notice it doesn't give me an error. And it shouldn't give me an error. It said, if type equals uh, error, then go ahead and give the output. Otherwise, it's just going to do nothing. Get the beauty of that? So that is the usage of an if statement. Let's take a look at the construction of that if statement in a little bit more detail. So in this case, what we're looking at, you'll see we have an if, and then there's some Boolean in parenthesis. Do you see that? And then we have the beginning of what the if statement does, whatever you want it to do, and then close it. Well, you want to watch this guy freak out, man. When you forget, like I don't have the closing bracket there, look what happened to the opening bracket. See the little red underneath it? This is where these ISEs are really handy to help us from making mistakes. And if we want to, we can even minimize the if statement if that's helpful to us for some reason. All right, so that's great, but what I want to do now, let's just keep staring at this, and what I'm going to add this time is I'm going to add an else statement. Watch carefully. All right, so you can see we have the exact same code, but we've added a little bit more. We still got the if statement, but now we've added else. Do you see that right there? So basically what we're saying is this. Sure. So if the value equals error, then do something. However, if it equals warning, then do something else. Okay. So let's take a look at that. So if Fred is equal to error, go ahead and run the get event log command else. If it's equal to warning, go ahead and get the event log command. So right now, it will give me back good input if I use either error or warning. Let's run F5. Oopsie. I think I see what the error is, guys, but I'm going to let, let me check it real quick. Grr. I'll give you a clue. It's a small typo. I'll let you watch while I fix it. Oh shoot, I may have fixed it already. Let me hit F5. Yeah, now it's working. Guys, I had I, I didn't I didn't have the right uh, number of brackets in there. That's all it was. Sorry. All right. Here we go. Input the type of log entry. And uh, let me do error. Let me type that in the right spot so it'll actually work. And I get all the errors. So I can run it again. I'm just hitting F5. And I can do warning, and then I get all the warnings. This one's a little long, so I'm going to let this scroll past for a minute. Now let me hit F5 again and type in Timmy. Boom, I get an error. And I should get an error because I haven't had any way to deal with that particular issue. So one of the things that I always find interesting about programmers, or especially people who are new to scripting, is that you're like, wait a minute, I would never type in 
anything other than error or warning. Well, you know, you will. You will. Uh, a lot of times people write their own scripts for their own cells and they don't put any kind of error handling or anything in there and it can often be a hard thing to transport to other people because you've got it customized and you know all the freaks and flukes about it. And uh, yeah, there you go. All right, so what I want to do this time is let's go ahead and uh, we're going to build on that if then else statement and we're going to use what's known as an else if. In this case, this allows us to have more than two options. This one better work right off the top. So let's take a look at this one this time. So what I've done here is I said if Fred is equal to error, then do that. Else if Fred is, see it there, it's else if. Do you see that right there? I keep clicking on the wrong stuff. There we go. Else if, and you'll see each one of those has its own bracket of logic. Then we go Fred, and then I'll look with this. Else, so if it doesn't equal to error or warning, then else, right host, got to be error or warning. Okay? So let's see if I got this one right. Let me get rid of this old junk from before. Clear the screen. I'm going to hit F5. All right. Input the type of log entry. Error. So that worked. Great. So I'm going to hit F5 again. Input the type of log entry, except this time I'm going to type Fred. That's not an option, is it? Got to be error or warning. Yay, look at me. I've set up some pretty, I'm using if, if statements to allow me to do some kind of cool stuff there. Now, the only downside is, is that if I'm a person who wants to check logs a lot, I'd like to set this script up to be in such a way that I can, you know, it just keeps turning itself off. In order for me to run this again, I'm going to have to, you know, right click on, on Jack Jack and hit run every time I want to use it. So what I want to do is I want to keep it up. I don't want it to shut down on me until I say quit. So to do that in this particular case, I'm going to use a do loop. So do loops are pretty cool. So it's basically the same code, but watch what I've added this time. All right, so this time I start off with something called do, and I have this opening bracket. So do, and this is pretty much the same code we saw before. Input the type of log entry. If it equals error, do error. If it equals warning, do that. Else, got to be an error or warning, and keep doing this while uh, Fred is not equal to quit. I've just seen errors in it. There was an extra, I don't know if anybody caught that. Did you see all the underlines? It told me I had an extra closed squiggly bracket I didn't need. So, are we feeling lucky? Let's see if this one will actually work. Ready? Here we go. So I'm going to clear the screen. I'm going to clear the screen harder. All right, here we go. Pressing F5. Input the type of log entry. Error. Shows the error. Press Enter to continue. Enter log entry, warning. Get the warning. Yeah, that's too long. I should have got it shorter. And I'm going to type in quit. And I got to type, did I, was it quit? Did I get that right? Interesting. So this is actually a fun, and I want you guys to look at what I did here. So, what happened is I entered the value quit, but the problem is I put it at the bottom of my logic, so it's not doing comparators when I want it to. So it's, this is an interesting logic issue, and any good programmer would be looking at the code I've written and laugh at me because you know this stuff is all established. So basically the answer is do and then first say, if it's equal to quit, then just stop right there. That's what I should have done. Instead, I kind of schlepped it at the bottom. 
of the logic. Think about that. It's still, if I didn't put it at the top, it's still going to run through the rest of the logic. So, interesting types of errors that we run into. But then it's actually not an error, is it? I mean, if you think about it, the code ran. I didn't get any big scary error screens come up, right? So there was no log there was no error in my logic. It did exactly what I told it to do. These are the fun little things you mess with. It is very important to me that you take some time to understand the if statement, the uh, if else, and the do statement. Uh, those are directly stated that they're going to be on the A+. Although I haven't seen any questions on it, Lord knows they, they can change that at any time. So uh, I hope that gives us a little bit of a start on, number one, I want to make sure you're comfortable with the ISE. Being able to save your own PS1 files, which we can do within the ISE itself, and understanding the different screens and how they work. So let's see how I did. I'm going to check for questions. Uh, where is it? I mean, I literally have like 20 windows open right now. I didn't lose everybody, so I guess we're doing okay. Oh no, people are crying. What does that mean? Did I just amuse people? Oh, Patricia Gase is a coder. Uh, see, that's, I don't like writing code in front of coders. Because I'm sloppy and ugly and messy. Oh, no, 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 no. All right. Guys, I don't see any questions. Scott Jernigan, am I missing anything here? Everybody seems to be okay. All right, good. All right. So, really, uh, we're not done with PowerShell, folks, but I, I want to make sure that you guys spend a little time. Um, you got to play with it at this point. And I would say do stuff with the event log. Get event log is a fun little tool. Uh, now keep in mind, I was filtering out just the uh, event types, but you can filter on all kinds of things in there. Matter of fact, see if I can make this work. Uh, let's see. So what I want to do here, this is, oops, this is the one place where this can become kind of handy. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to type in uh, git event log. All right, so you can see it's popped up. And now underneath here gives you some fairly handy information, whoopsies, that you can use to help understand. God bless it. Why does that keep going like that? So it gives you the type of information that it's going to be outputting, like, for example, event type. So I can see the different types of, this is amazing that that doesn't show up. Here we go. So I can go here, like for example, under entry type, and I hit the pull down. And you can actually see the different types of uh, entry types that you can use as an output parameter. There's a lot more in here. And I got to be honest with you, I'm not a huge fan of that thing, but it has its moments and stuff like that. It can be extremely handy. All right. Let me, I'm going to check for questions one more time. Just checking for questions. All right, I'll assume I'm doing a really good job because I don't see any questions. All right. Is there a nice repository of pre-made scripts that you use? There is. I was going to save that for later, but we can talk about it now. Let me pull that up for you. There's more than one. Uh,
Microsoft has the one I tend to go to more than anybody else's. And let me bring that up so you guys can look at it. <laughs> so this is the uh, script center. And it has, well, like right now, there's 16,000 scripts in there. And they're just for all kinds of different categories and ideas for almost anything you want to do within the world of Windows. And they sort them by popularity. So there's all kinds of toys out there. It is my goal that once we're done learning about PowerShell uh, and we have a nice Active Directory server up within VirtualBox, I want to come back to PowerShell and actually start querying it and do some you know, hairy things like you know, adding domain users and stuff like that. So that's why at only 3.36, I swear to God, this time flies by because I'm having so much fun being with you guys. So what I want to do now is let's at least get a start on setting up VirtualBox, okay? Now, I'm assuming most of you guys have set up VirtualBox to some degree, but let's go ahead and kind of jump through the hoops so we understand where we're going. Understand what the goal is here, guys. We're going to set up a Active Directory, a Windows Active Directory, probably Active Directory under Server 2019, okay? We're not going to finish that today. We're going to barely get started. We'll get that set up, and then we'll set up one Windows 10 client, put them together in their own little private network, which is on the internet, but it won't be part of our network. And then once that's done, we can come back to PowerShell and run some more interesting scripts than just querying event log. Querying event log is important. Lots of people do that, but we can do more. So uh, to get to that point, let's go ahead and fire up VirtualBox. Mm -mm -mm. All right, so to get the ball rolling, what I've got here is uh, this is the, the virtual, here, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller, so hopefully it'll all fit. All right, that's as small as it gets. All right, so this is the virtual box manager, and this is the different virtual machines I have on my system right now. So one of the first things that people need to be comfortable with is that you have to understand how networking works within virtual box. So we have a, an entire episode, AMA, where we talked about this, but as a quick review, when you create a virtual machine, it, its networking can work in a lot of different ways, all right? Uh, for example, it can be all by itself. It's as though it has a network card, but it's not plugged in. You can do that. You can set up two or three machines to be all a part of their own little private network. They have no connection to the outside world at all. You can set up one machine and it will act as a peer. So like if your IP address, your DHCP server on your, say your router, is passing out 192.168.1s, you can set up what's known as a bridged adapter, and the bridge adapter, your VM, will also be a part of the 192.168.1 network. It'll be just like another computer on your network and everybody can see it. What I like to do when I'm setting up uh, Active Directory as a, as a R&D type thing, is I like to set it up in its own little private network. Now, VirtualBox creates a network called a NAT network by default. It makes its own little virtual router that acts between your computer and its own thing. And this usually passes out 192.168.56 addresses is pretty common. And that's fine. You can use that if you want. But I want to show you something a lot cooler. What we're going to do is set up our own private NAT network that's going to have its passing out its own IP address range. So, and what we're going to do is we're going to put the uh, Active Directory machine in there, and then we're going to put a Windows client in there, okay? So let's go through that process. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is have to set up that NAT. So you go over here, and you go to Preferences. Now I need to warn you guys, there's a lot of other stuff in here that will deceive you. Like it says, Network Operations Manager. That is nothing. Don't worry about that. Or it's going to say, Host Network Manager. That is nothing, don't worry about that either. Host network manager is just for that default NAT network, okay? 
So what we're going to do instead is you're going to go to File and you go to eh, you're going to go to File. You go to Preferences. Do you see it right there? And what we're going to set up under Network is our own little private NAT network. So right now I've got a NAT network called 10.0.2. So I'm going to make a new one. And I just made a new one, but now I have to go in here. And I can set a whole lot of stuff. Like, what do I want to pass out? I can pass out 192, 168, 44. Now everybody's going to be on 192, 168, 44. Okay. Uh, I can set up a DHCP server just by clicking that on. If I want it to do IPv6, it'll do IPv6. It'll actually query my system and, and uh, grab IPv6 information if I want to. Advertise the default IPv6 route. I don't want to get into too much of this. But the bottom line is, just by doing this, now I don't want to call it NAT network because I have a lot of these. So I put the number in here to help me remember what it's for. I think I can put periods in. Let's see what happens. Now you see, I'm assuming you guys can read this. You see it says NAT 192.168.44. I have just created my own little NAT network. And now when I start making new virtual machines, I'm going to say I want you to go over to that NAT network. I don't want to use that 192.168.44. I'm just showing you can put almost anything in there you want. And it automatically sets up a NAT, uh, a virtualized NAT router in there for you. It has a virtual DHCP server. It's sweet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the process of setting up a uh, machine. So before we do that, where do you get Windows Server? Oh, we are going to run out of time. I'm going to do what I can in this time period, guys. It didn't feel like it was two hours. All right. Yes, I'm typing in download Windows Server. Okay, let me show you what I'm doing. All right, so I just typed in download Windows Server and Windows Server free trial for Microsoft. That's what I'm looking for. So you can download uh, your own copy of Windows Server to install your own server on premise, or you can actually go, they'll put one on the cloud for you and you can do that way too. Let's not add cloud complexity right now. So we just download a free trial. And you gotta say what you want. I want an ISO image, because that's easy for me to work with. Uh, what else is it asking for? I gotta type in all my information, and then it will allow me, it will download me a, uh, I believe it's a hundred, yeah, 180 day, copy of Windows Server. So you get an ISO image, okay? That's important. So I've got the ISO image, I already downloaded it. You guys now know where to download it. Yes, you have to give them your first name and last name and a legitimate email address. Sorry. But you get a free 180 day copy to play with. What happens after 180 days? Well, you go get another copy. All right, so we've got that downloaded. Let's go back up here. And what we're going to do now is we're going to actually start the process of setting up the uh, Windows VM. Now, I've already got one here, but let's do another one because, you know, it's fun. So I'm going to add. Oh, no, 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 no. I want to do a new one. There we go. New. Dirk. And I'm going to call it Mike's. Usually descriptive names are very helpful here. Test Windows 2019 Server. It says Windows 7, that makes me laugh. Is there a Windows 2019? Here we go. Here's Windows 2019 64-bit. Hit next. Okay, here's the first big problem. Whenever you're setting up a Windows Server in a virtual machine, the default amount of RAM is laughably small. So you really, if you can do 4,096, that is good. If you have eight gigabytes of RAM in your computer, 
you're probably not even going to be able to do this, okay? You really need 16, okay? Um, you could probably make it crawl with less than 4 gigs of RAM, but I, I would be nervous. So go buy some more RAM. Okay, maybe it's not completely free if you're only running 8, eight gigs. What about 4? Forget it. All right, let's get back in here. All right, so I've got it up to four gigs of RAM. I'm going to hit next. Create a virtual disk now. Yes, I want to have a virtual disk now. I want to make a default, the default virtual disk image. I want it to be dynamically allocated. Pretty much all hypervisors have some kind of dynamically allocated feature for mass storage. Because you got to keep in mind, pretty really much what you're doing here, guys, is you're making one huge file. It's a monster of a file. But the default size was like 50 gigs. I don't want to instantly eat up 50 gigs of my hard drive. So it's dynamically allocated. If, if Until I fill it up, it's going to be really small. A few hundred megabytes. So I like dynamically allocated. Here I can actually set the size I want it to be. Because it's dynamically allocated, I'm going to leave it at 50 and I'll be happy. And it is made. You see it right there? I've got it made. Now the problem is, is how do I install Windows on it, right? So because the machine's powered off, it's never been started before, all I can do is go to Settings, all right? And I go under Storage, and you'll see the it has an optical media built into it. And what we're going to do is we're going to, let me click on there. There we go. And then right over here, do you see this guy? I click on this and I select the ISO file that I want to use. Let me do that again because I don't think you guys saw what I did well enough. That's just in the background, don't worry about that. So I'm going to click on this, and I'm going to choose a file. Now, I know where I put my copy of Windows Server. It's a server evaluation. But if you needed to, you could just you know scroll around and find wherever your download folder or whatever it might be. Mine just happened to be convenient and handy. And I'm almost done here, not quite. The next thing I want to do is go over to Network. Now, by default, it wants to go to your default NAT network, which is going to put it in a 192.158.56 address. But if I've done this right, I should go to NAT network. And you'll see I've got two choices here. Because these are the ones I made when I went to that other stuff. And I'm going to put it in, uh, I can put it in 192.168.44, or I can put it in 10.0.2. I'm going to leave it in 10.0.2, okay? The moment my Windows server comes to life, I'm going to have to make very good and sure that I give it an IP address of 10.0.2. I don't know, 10 or something like that, because this thing's going to be passing out DHCP that's 10.0.2. So, like my Windows client is going to get a 10.0.2.4 or something like that. So, I have to be very sure that my my Active Directory system, my Windows server has a static <clears throat> static IP address and because I've set my network up like this it's going to be 10.0.2. I don't know 10 or something like that. Do you understand? It's really important. <laughs> they won't be able to talk to each other if they don't have the same IP address uh, network ID folks. So anything that I install that uh, isn't static is going to be 10.0.2. something. So I got to be really careful and make sure when I install this guy and I'm going to get 10.0.2. something as a static address. Okay, so we're going to leave it uh, right there for now. And that is all you have to do. And I'm going to go ahead and start the installation now. Hit OK. And I'm going to start this guy up. And it's going to start installing. And I don't want to sit here, and I'm not going to waste 
the last nine minutes of, of this AMA, but it is my dear and great hope that you guys can take what I've done up to this point and you can go ahead and set up a VirtualBox image and get the installation started, okay? I would ask you to not do any more of the installation. We'll pick this back up on Wednesday and we'll get, get that started. And I'll show you guys how to set up. Now look, I'm not a perfect expert on Windows Server. I'm pretty good at it, but I got enough to get you started. And once this is set up, you got half a year to play with it, which should be plenty of time. Here, I'll give you a little clue for a starter, because it's coming in already. There we go. So here, here it begins the process. So it's like uh, just the default Windows goo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next. Install now, yeah. And make sure this thing's lighting up, and then we'll move on, and I'll answer questions. All right, so what you want to install is the standard evaluation with, uh, you want the desktop experience too, because otherwise it won't install a GUI. <laughs> How's that for fun? Yeah, I'm not kidding. Make sure you do the desktop experience. Blah, 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 blah. Gonna do a custom install. There's my big 50 gigabyte hard drive. We hit next. And then that goes ahead and gets started. All right. Let's all get to that point. So on Wednesday, I hope you guys will be there. If you have a problem, send me an email. Remember, our goal here is to have an Active Directory server up and running so we can go back to PowerShell God, I, I've said PowerPoint twice, didn't I? Scott hasn't said anything. Check typo. Scott Jernigan says I have a typo? Impossible. I think we're okay, Scott. Scott told me I may have done a typo. If I did do a typo, I fixed it, so I think we're okay. All right. Yeah, that installation is going to take a minimum of 30 minutes from this point. All right, let's take a look at questions, see where we're at up to this point. How am I doing? Um, just starting right at the last question. Uh, I tried to create VM and it gave me error message that says, make sure the parent really exists and that you have permissions to create the machine folder. Uh, yeah, Mark, first of all, in order to do this, you want to be a local administrator on the Windows system that you're installing all this on. So it sounds like you're logging in as just a regular old uh, user. You can't. You have to be an administrator. So that would probably be what's happening to you right there. Patricia Grace, I've never even looked at the net. Oh, the network option's great. Because with the network option, you can really configure what these virtual machines are doing, right? So you understand what I'm doing here is I'm setting up a NAT. Could I have used the regular NAT? I don't know if you saw in VirtualBox, there was just NAT. And then there was another thing that said NAT networking. If you select NAT, you're going to use the default NAT that comes with VirtualBox, and you're going to be passing out 192, 168, usually 56s. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I tend to use it for other stuff. So when I want to set up an Active Directory network, because I want to play with Active Directory, I'm going to go ahead and set up my own special NAT network, and I almost always use 10.0.2, just out of habit. And I know it's separated from everything else. I have other uh, systems on here that are using that 192.168.56. Could I use it? Yes. Do I want to? No. Uh, and it's actually kind of fun. Like the other thing a lot of people don't pick up on when they're working with the uh, virtual box and guys, all virtual machine hypervisors do this. I'm talking about virtual box. You can do the exact same thing in VMware. You can do the same thing in Hyper-V. It's not special. How you click to get to it's special, but other than that, it works the same way every time. Uh, you can, uh, 
setting up bridged networking is very interesting. Honestly, if I'm just setting up an individual system because I just want to play with a new copy of Linux or something like that, I'll set it up as a bridged network. Keep in mind that that exposes you to some danger because that virtual machine is now part of your LAN, just like your switches and your other boxes and everything else is there. So uh, be aware of that as, as an option. But yeah, work it, the power of any hypervisor is messing with the network settings. You can have a lot of fun in there. Justin Kinsey just joined. Dude, I got four more minutes. I'm going to use every second of this. Web Dev Bootcamp. If I have Windows 10 Pro with Hyper-V, do I need VirtualBox? No. But Web Dev, Pro, uh, Web Dev Bootcamp, I'm going to do this demo using uh, VirtualBox. So Hyper-V would be a different animal. You can get there the same way. In fact, Hyper-V does some cool things that you don't see with VirtualBox. Like, for example, Hyper-V... So like we went to those network settings and made that 192.168.44 net network. In Hyper-V, you actually get a little box. <laughs> it's more graphical. I don't know, maybe some people like that. But it all works out the same way. Christy, how's it going? Am I going okay, man? Justin Kids, you did miss some good stuff. Henry Bruzo, hello to say goodbye. <laughs> Job is going great. Good, man. Uh, Henry, nobody set up a Discord channel that I'm aware of. Yeah, but guys, you didn't miss anything. It's always recorded. You can check them back later whenever you want. So I, I got to be honest with you. Uh, as, as we wrap up the end of this day, we're done. I can't do anything else with less than three minutes left. It would mean a lot to me if you guys were to at your own convenience, fire up PowerShell's ISE and play with it a little bit. I would like to see you use some of the commandlets that we've already been talking about or come up with your own if you want, I don't care, and make a couple of PS1 files and save them on your desktop and go ahead and run them. Let's see them work. That, that would be something I would very much like to see. I don't want to review how to save scripts under the ISE. I, I think Going forward, I'm going to count on you guys to know that. All right, so Wednesday, I got to warn you, we're probably going to eat up most of Wednesday getting this network set up in such a way that it's going to work right. It's a little, it's a little in, developed. Uh, you, if you want to do something between now and Wednesday, go ahead and from that same resource, download a copy of Windows 10, 180-day uh, demo version of Windows 10 and go ahead and set that up. I don't care what you do with that Windows 10 system. Just make sure it's in the same network as the Active Directory one that you're setting up. So if you picked uh, NAT 10.0.2 or whatever you called yours, that's fine. Just make sure they're physically in the same one. You can change it later if you're wrong, so it's not a panic. It's just going to make you uh, a little bit, it's going to make it a little bit easier when we pick up where we left off on Wednesday. For those of you who are interested in PowerShell, I'm gonna warn you, we're probably not gonna be able to do PowerShell on Wednesday in order to get all this set up. So it'll probably be next Monday before we hit PowerShell hard again. Uh, we'll see, fingers crossed. So I go, it's called an AMA, guys. Ask Mike anything. Sometimes we'll even answer it the way you want. All right, okay guys, don't forget the uh, AMA special deal this week, 50% off. All A plus, Net plus, and Security plus total testers. Just type in Columbus over at www.totalsim.com after you got your fat loops for 50% off. Absolutely amazing day. Guys, uh, man, it just it felt like it just went like that today. Was it just me? I, I literally thought I'd been here for 30 minutes. All right. But anyway, guys, uh, we'll pick back up. Remember, we're going to be setting up uh, our virtual box. Hopefully, you've got a copy of virtual box. Hopefully, you got virtual box 6.1 because that supports all the virtualization features, very convenient. Downloading a copy of Windows Server, downloading a copy of Windows 10, and uh, if you're bored between now and tomorrow, start installing the Windows 10. I don't care what you put in there, I can always fix that. I do not want you to install the Windows Server because there's a couple of features in there that are changeable, but they're long and painful, and I'd rather not do it if we don't need to. 
All right, guys, that is it. It is four o'clock. I am out of here. Bring in your questions. I'm sorry if I missed any. We're kind of uh, deep in this. And uh, we will uh, pick right back up on Wednesday. And we will be setting up Active Directory. Until then, this is your little Uncle Mikey saying good night, kids. Good night.